Please stay tuned for important disclosure information at the conclusion of this episode. Welcome to the Investing Insights Podcast from Morningstar. In this week's podcast, Dave Sequeira and Susan Jabinski talk about where to invest your money in 2022. Dan Satiroff shares his thoughts on great international ETFs having a tough year. And Christine Benz and Susan Jabinski discuss retirement in a bear market. Let's get started. Here is Dave Sequeira from Morningstar Research Services with Susan Jabinski from Morningstar Inc. Hi, I'm Susan Jabinski with Morningstar. The second quarter of 2022 has come to a close. Where can investors find opportunities as we head into the third quarter? Here with me to answer that question and a few others is Dave Sequeira. Dave is Morningstar's chief U.S. market strategist. So Dave, let's start out by talking a little bit about market valuations today um, based on our proprietary metrics at Morningstar. So recap sort of what happened with valuations overall in the second quarter and how things are looking as we head into the third quarter. You know, coming into the second quarter, what I think we really saw was a convergence of those four main headwinds that we identified at the beginning of the year in our 2022 outlook. And of course, those being the slowing rate of U.S. economic growth, the Fed now tightening monetary policy, inflation running hot, and rising interest rates. So I think the four of those together, and of course, then you have to put, you know, what ended up happening over in Russia and Ukraine on top of that and the effects that we've had there, all of that together. So we saw, you know, a pretty strong downturn in the markets in the second quarter. Now, coming into the third quarter, we actually think the pendulum has swung too far to the downside. So we actually think the markets are getting to be pretty significantly undervalued at this point. In fact, when you look at an aggregate of all those stocks we cover that trade here in the U.S., we think the market's trading at about a 17% discount to our fair value. Now, on a historical basis, that's pretty cheap. So when I look back over the past 12 years, there's only been a couple of other instances we've seen the market at this low of a valuation. Of course, you know, March 2020, during the emergence of the pandemic, we saw the markets with a big sell-off at that point in time. End of 2018, if you remember, there was the big growth scare at that point. You know, the Fed had already been tightening monetary policy for about a year, you know, going up into that. And then you have to go all the way back to March of 2011. And just to remember what happened back then, you know, that was when, you know, we had the Greek debt crisis. People were concerned about, you know, possible contagion going into Italy and Spain and Portugal, and then even going into the EU banking system. So we think that stocks are pretty undervalued at this point in time. And now is actually a good time for investors to be, I'd say, judiciously adding to their equity exposures, especially in those high quality companies, those that we think have a wide economic moat. So let's look at the market then and valuation through a few different lenses, um, starting maybe first with market capitalization and style. Now, you mentioned in your quarterly outlook that stocks of most sizes and styles are undervalued today um, as we're heading into the third quarter, but where are some of the best opportunities? Well, among the different styles, I really like a barbell portfolio structure right now between value stocks and growth stocks. So growth stocks, of course, got hit the hardest you know, during the second quarter. And we think growth stocks across the different categories are the ones that are the most undervalued at this point. And then value stocks, they were best positioned at the beginning of the year. You know, they haven't fallen as much as what we've seen in like the blend stocks and the growth stocks. But we think those are value, valuable at this point in time as well. So I like that structure between you know, the two of those categories categories. And then among the different market capitalizations, both large cap and mid cap, pretty much trading at about the same type of valuation, the small caps are where we see the most opportunities for investors today. So then let's pivot over to a little bit of a discussion about you know, economic moats. Mm -hmm. And how do valuations look when you compare sort of wide moat stocks with no moat stocks today? Well, interestingly, what we saw in the second quarter is that the wide moat stocks, they fell just as much as the rest of the index. And in some cases, they, sell, they sold off you know, even more than the rest of the marketplace. To some degree, I think maybe over the past month and over the past couple of weeks, there's been some indiscriminate selling in the marketplace. Now, I think that with liquidity drying up, portfolio managers got to the point where if they needed to raise cash, they were selling not necessarily what they wanted to, but they were selling what they could. And those high quality wide moat companies, of course, will have you know, the best liquidity. So we think that wide moat stocks as a category are probably the most undervalued between wide moat, narrow moat, and no moat and certainly see a lot of opportunities for investors in that space. So then let's focus a little bit more on the wide mode space in particular. Mm -hmm. Give us a few names, perhaps in the large cap, wide, among large cap wide mode stocks that look particularly attractive today. Sure, well let's kind of go down the list here. So first I would say Meta. 
Meta is probably, I think, our most differentiated call from the rest of the marketplace. So wide mode, five stars, trading it, I think about half of what we think that company is worth. So with Meta, the real problem what's going on with that right now is the market has been disappointed by the advertising revenue that they've been able to generate. So earlier this year, you know, Apple put some privacy measures in place. So the advertising right now is a little bit less valuable. So they haven't been able to get the same kind of fees and growth on that advertising. But when we think about advertising, special especially in the digital space, you know, there's a long-term secular growth trend that's not going to stop going on there. And we think Meta is probably one of the best positioned you know, for future growth in that digital advertising. You know, the next one I would mention would be Amazon, you know, another wide mode five-star stock. I think that's trading at about a 40% discount you know, to fair value. Again, the market's been disappointed a little bit on that one, but you have to remember too with Amazon, they saw huge amounts of growth during the beginning and throughout most of the pandemic mm -hmm. as people shifted their buying to online. So we're up against you know, really tough two-year comps in that name right now. The thing with Amazon is we think the market is missing is the AWS business, their web services business, and their advertising business. Both of those are very valuable and mm -hmm. we don't think that they're getting the credit for those right now. You know, and lastly, Disney would be the other one that I would highlight you know, at this point. So in the media space, we're seeing an ongoing shift with a lot of these traditional media companies that they're moving their content to their own platforms and now charging for it you know, themselves. So that has been causing a short-term disruption within that space. But when we think about Disney, we think that they have not only some of the best content out there, but they have some of the best platforms out there and will be able to do the best in that space. So let's stick with high quality names, but let's go down the market cap scale a little bit and look at some mid and small cap names sure. that are undervalued. So Compass Minerables would be the first one that I would mention there. So Compass, again, has had some difficulties in that they changed up their capital allocation structure last year. So they used to be a very high dividend paying stock, you know, wide economic moat, very steady business in that they, have, they make de-icing salt for you know, the winter time. And so again, their wide moat was based on being that low cost supplier and paying that high dividend. Well, they decided that instead of paying that high dividend, the company would rather use that cash in order to start making acquisitions, specifically growing into the lithium space. So a lot of investors that had been in that name in the past were those investors looking for that high dividend payment. So right now, I still think we're seeing you know, a bit of a change going on where those type of investors are still looking to exit the stock and we're looking for new investors you know, who are looking for that growth that that company hadn't really been producing you know, in the past. The other name that I would like to talk about would be Equifax. So again, when you think about it, there are three main credit bureaus, a little bit of an oligopoly you know, in that business. And Equifax's wide economic moat is based on the part of the business in which they do you know, income verification, employment verification, and that's really used with the mortgage business. So that's probably their highest product margin. Well, with interest rates going up, you know, we're going to see less mortgages you know, going forward, you know, a lot less refinancing going on, maybe a slowdown you know, in the housing market as well. So I think the market right now is looking at the slowdown in that part of their business. They're over-extrapolating how much that's going to slow down into the future. And so that's why we think that there's still a good amount of value in that stock. Well, Dave, thanks for your time today, your outlook on the third quarter, and of course, your stock picks. We appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Susan. I'm Susan Jabinski with Morningstar. Thanks for tuning in. Expand your investing horizons and look to the long term with Morningstar's podcast, The Long View. Join hosts Christine Benz and Jeff Patak as they talk to influential leaders in investing, advice, and personal finance. Search for and subscribe to The Long View today. Next, here is Dan Satiroff from Morningstar Research Services. 2022 has been a tough year for stocks in general and international stocks in particular. So the three international stock ETFs on tap for today all focus on high quality companies. We think all three are great long-term investments that should provide a smoother ride than the broader foreign stock market. The first ETF on my list is Silver Rated Vanguard International Dividend Appreciation ETF, ticker VIGI. It looks for foreign stocks that have consistently grown their regular cash dividend payments for seven years or more, and it forgoes those that are most likely to cut dividend payments in the near future. Seven years of consistent dividend growth is a really strict hurdle that pulls VIGI toward well-managed, shareholder-friendly companies. It skews toward names trading at higher multiples and lower dividend yields. 
This ETF tends to hold highly profitable stocks that not only have the capacity to make dividend payments, but also a willingness to do so. Focusing on dividend growth causes this portfolio to focus on stocks from stable sectors, such as healthcare and consumer staples, then its category index, the MSCI Acqui XUSA Growth Index, with proportionally smaller stakes in the information technology sector. While we like VIGI's long-term potential, it had shed 19.2% for 2022 through June 15th. My second ETF takes a more direct route to high-quality stocks. Silver-rated iShares International Quality Factor ETF with, its, with the ticker IQLT looks for stocks with a strong combination of profitability, low debt, and consistent earnings growth. It tweaks the weights of these stocks to emphasize names with the strongest combination of these characteristics, while honoring some additional constraints to prevent sector biases from creeping into its portfolio. This particular strategy does not consider a given stock's valuation, so its average price multiples tend to skew higher than the MSCI Acqui XUSA index. But that doesn't necessarily mean its holdings are priced above their true underlying value. Like VIGI, many of IQLT's holdings have strong competitive advantages that may justify higher multiples, while helping them perform well in the future. Its portfolio has tended to hold more stocks with wide economic moat ratings than the MSCI Acqui XUSA index. Despite those attractive characteristics, IQLT was still down 19.7% for the year through June 15th. My third and final ETF is a bit of a sleeper. Spider MSCI EFA Strategic Factors ETF has a Morningstar Analyst rating of silver and trades under the ticker QEFA. It's a multi-factor strategy that splits its portfolio, portfolio evenly across the value, low volatility, and quality factors. But the quality and low volatility factors aren't completely independent of each other. Both tend to favor many of the same stocks held by VIGI and IQLT. So the overall portfolio tends to lead toward the same names. Rather than going all in on these types of companies like VIGI and IQLT, QEFA's value-oriented sleeves provide some balance. It should be a benefit when cheaper stocks outperform their more expensive counterparts, as they have over the first few months of this year. While QEFA is down about 18.4% for the year, that value sleeve has provided a little bit of an advantage over VIGI and IQLT. Lastly, Susan Jabinski and Christine Benz from Morningstar Inc. discuss protecting your retirement in a bear market. This year's downturn in the U.S. stock market has been nerve-wracking for all types of retirement investors. People accumulating assets for retirement, those approaching retirement, and those who are already retired. Joining me to discuss how to ensure that the market crisis doesn't do a number on your retirement plan is Christine Benz. Christine is Morningstar's Director of Personal Finance and Retirement Planning. Hi, Christine. Thank you for being here today. Hi, Susan. Great to see you. So let's sort of take this group by group. So for those investors who are, say, maybe under 50 years old, are still in the accumulation phase of saving for retirement, what steps should they be taking to ensure that this bearish market doesn't knock their plan off track? Right. It's counterintuitive because for this group, I worry about them the least because they are many years from retirement. But this is probably their first bear market mm -hmm. for many of these folks. They may have been investing during sort of the 2007 through 2009 period, but many of the newer investors were not. And so I think that these early bear markets early in your investment career can be incredibly nerve wracking. They can be psychologically really difficult. I think the key thing to think about is control. What levers do I control? And the main one at this life stage is your contribution rate. That is going to be the main determinant of your plan's success or failure. And the good news about down, down markets is that with the same contribution rate, you can buy more shares than you could have when the market was more elevated. So I would focus on that contribution rate, see if you can't find room in your budget to potentially even lift your contribution rate, and then also check your asset allocation and make sure that you have a plan for rebalancing back to that target asset allocation. A target date fund is a good 
tool, I think, for keeping your portfolio's asset allocation on track on an ongoing basis because part and parcel of such a fund is that that rebalancing is built in. If you're not using it's kind of an all-in-one product like that, just make sure that you have a system for rebalancing. And rebalancing basically means that you're stepping up your exposure to the asset classes that have dropped. For most portfolios, stocks have dropped the most recently. So, Christine, what about that group of investors who are getting closer to retirement? What steps should they be taking today? Well, contribution rates are super important for people at this life stage, too, because they will be retired for many years. So those additional contributions that they make today can still compound and make a difference in the health of their plan. So they, too, should be looking at whether they can bump up their contribution rates. Then turn your attention to asset allocation. At this life stage, if you're in your 50s, early 60s, with retirement on the horizon, you generally want to be looking for balance in your retirement portfolio. So you absolutely need stocks for long-term growth, but you also need some safer investments in your portfolio. So you want high quality, short and intermediate term bonds. If retirement's very close at hand, I don't think it's too early to start building up some cash reserves. So balance, I think, should be your watchword with respect to your asset allocation at this life stage. And you also say that if, you know, retirement is sort of closer on the horizon rather than further away, um, that you need to start putting some details around your retirement plan at this point. What do you mean by that? Right. I think it's time to get serious about forecasting your total income needs. And if retirement is quite close at hand, you should be fairly clear on how your living situation might change if you're planning to relocate or buy a second home or whatever it might be. So do some work on what your budget might be. I like the idea of even mapping it out for several years, even a couple of decades where you're plotting, well, in this year, I think we'll need a new roof. In this year, I think we'll need to buy a new car, whatever it might be move those lumpy outlays into your forecasted spending. From there, you can look at how much of those income needs will come from non-portfolio income sources, so Social Security, a pension if you're lucky enough to have one, if you're someone who owns rental properties, you're getting income from those. those. Look at all those non-portfolio income sources. Subtracting them from your total income needs will give you a lens onto your anticipated withdrawal rate in retirement. And I think you want to give some thought to whether that's viable. Our team at Morningstar, as well as some other researchers, have looked at withdrawal rates. The name of the game, especially in down markets, is to think about being a little bit conservative, especially if you are about to retire into what looks like a difficult market environment. So let's talk about the people who are already retired. These people are drawing from their portfolios already. Um, Now, of course, this type of market can be the most nerve wracking of all for for these investors, right? That's right. So for them, they want to focus on what they can control. So withdrawal rates would be somewhat within their control. A lot of the research that I referenced points to the value of being variable if you can with your withdrawal. So that means that in really good markets, like we had from 2019 through 2021, you could potentially take more from your portfolio. The trade-off is that when things are down as they are today, if you can potentially take less, that is something that can be hugely advantageous to your plan. On the other hand, it's also a heavy lift given what we're seeing from an inflationary standpoint. So look at that withdrawal rate. You want to look back on the full year really to assess the viability of your withdrawal rate. Also look at your asset allocation and your sub-asset allocation and be thoughtful about where you're going for those withdrawals. So not just how much you're taking out, but also where you're going for the withdrawals. I like the idea of retirees holding some cash, some high quality short-term bonds on an ongoing basis to help meet those income needs on an ongoing basis. I think that that's kind of the the linchpin of a bucket type strategy. That's a good starting point when thinking about how to structure your in retirement portfolio. And finally, I would say for people at this life stage, I think it can be super tempting to move into this mode where you're really paying a lot of attention to the market, where you're watching a lot of CNBC, you're checking Morningstar.com throughout the day. 
don't do that. For your own mental health, really stick with whatever plan that you have for monitoring your portfolio. We've got good articles on the site, but don't spend time monitoring your portfolio balance because I think that can kind of get you into a negative cycle where perhaps you're inclined to make changes that otherwise you probably shouldn't make. Well, Christine, thank you so much for your time today and your perspective during what's a very interesting time in the markets and for those of us saving for retirement and those of us who are in it. We appreciate it. Thank you so much, Susan. I'm Susan Jabinski with Morningstar. Thanks for tuning in. That does it for this week's Investing Insights podcast from Morningstar. We hope you have enjoyed our program and we welcome your feedback. Please send your comments and questions to podcast at Morningstar.com. From everyone here at Morningstar, thanks for listening. This recording is for informational purposes only and should not be considered investment advice. Opinions expressed are as of the date of recording. Such opinions are subject to change. The views and opinions of guests on this program are not necessarily those of Morningstar Inc. and its affiliates. Morningstar and its affiliates are not affiliated with this guest or his or her business affiliates unless otherwise stated. Morningstar does not guarantee the accuracy or the completeness of the data presented herein. The podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered tax advice. Please consult a tax and or financial professional for advice specific to your individual circumstances. Morningstar Research Services, LLC, is a subsidiary of Morningstar, Inc. and is registered with and governed by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Morningstar Research Services shall not be responsible for any trading decisions, damages, or other losses resulting from or related to the information, data analysis, or opinions, or their use. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. All investments are subject to investment risk, including possible loss of principal. Individuals should seriously consider if an investment is suitable for them by referencing their own financial position, investment objectives, and risk profile before making any investment decision.